Jetzt äh, freue ich mich sehr ähm, auf den Talk mit Francesca Morini und Tobias Kauer von der FH Potsdam vom Urban Complexity Lab, die uns erklären werden, wie geht man da eigentlich ran, die Daten ähm, zu sammeln? Wie packt man seine Beobachtungen in Daten? Viel Spaß dabei. Hello everyone, I'm Francesca. And my name is Tobias. And welcome to Working the Data. Today we are going to explain you what urban data are, how to collect them, and how close you have to go into the street to actually collect them. Uh, but before we dive into the presentation, uh, we want to introduce ourselves a little bit. We come from the Urban Complexity Lab, which is an interdisciplinary research group uh, with a strong focus on visualization. Uh, and we are at the FA Potsdam. Uh, we have a very uh, amazing team um, composed by coders and researchers and information designer, most, mostly. Um, I am an information designer and researcher myself and soon to be PhD candidate at the Sodeturn School of Journalism. Uh, right now I am working at the UC lab, but before that I was doing a master's degree at, the, at Politecnico di Milano in communication design. Um, I have been working on city on city related topics, uh, especially with a strong focus on commuting and temporal uh, settlement inside the city. Uh, right now we are focusing on how commuters between Berlin and Potsdam uh, live their journeys. Uh, I also I am also working on climate visualizations. Right now we are developing the climatescenarios.org, which is a platform for finance and policy advisors that want to uh, dive into climate related topics. Uh, before doing all that and before joining the UC lab, I also worked briefly at a, a journalistic project um, on North Korean defectors, trying to understand how, how what kind of propaganda is going on in North Korea and how people are escaping concentration camps. On a more um, light and personal side, I also explored a little bit data physicalization, creating uh, real life maps that can be activated through sensors to be explored. Yes, I also want to briefly introduce myself. Uh, my name is Tobias Kauer. I'm a visualization researcher and designer. Um, I'm a PhD candidate at the uh, Visual and Interactive Data Lab at the Uni University of Edinburgh. Um, but I'm also, and that's why I'm mostly here today, uh, an associate at the Urban Complexity Lab. Um, I also work as a visualization engineer uh, at the Social Dynamics Group um, of Nokia Bell Labs in Cambridge, which is kind of like the uh, research and development arm of Nokia. Um, I, was, I, I want to also present some of my work and also give a brief introduction of what we think is urban data and urban data visualization. Um, one project I was working on with Nokia Bell Labs um, is this, which is a map that shows us basically three different things. On the one hand, we see how likely people in London um, are, like how, how likely it is that they get diabetes. Um, but we also see what the income of different neighborhoods is and um, how high or low the, the nutrient diversity of their diet is, like how well do they eat. And um, this actually comes from a wide variety of sources, including 1.6 billion purchases from a um, grocery store in London um, that we basically analyzed to make this visualization, but also other sources. And we, we crammed all this data in there um, to kind of see how do these three things relate. And what, what we see is, and what I like about the visualization is that obviously we, we see how um, the richer people, the richer neighborhoods buy better food and therefore are less likely to get diabetes. And on the other hand, we see peoples and households with lower income be not being able to buy such a diverse diet um, and therefore are more likely get, to get diabetes. But what I find interesting is that if you, if you look at this um, chart on the, the left side, on the, on the top left corner and the bottom right corner, um, these are like the, a bit more the, the unlikely combinations uh, of, of these visualizations. High income, but 
bad health or low income, but, but good health. And this is what we kind of want to do with visualization. What happens um, in the unexpected places um, and what happens in the top left and bottom right corner. Um, so this is what we're trying to do today, find out how we can make these patterns visible. Another project I was working on, and I kind of like this um, as an introduction because it was my personal Corona panic weekend project, uh, like a few days of, of, of work when I did not know where to go. Um, and basically what it is, is a visualization of um, city names and villages of all the German towns and villages and a visualization of how do they end? What, what, is the, what are the last few characters in the name of that village? Um, and if we start to visualize that, we, we see a pattern emerge. Um, for example, what is highlighted in, in, in the visualization, uh, the visibility of its and our in the northeastern part of Germany, but also we have a lot of Bach and Ingen and Hofen in the south. And what I like about this visualization is that if we only look at the table of this data, like the, the latitude, the longitude, and the city name, this is kind of boring, and we would not get any um, insight from that. But as soon as we plot it on a visualization, we, we see this pattern emerge. And again, this is, to me, what is interesting about urban and geographic data visualization. Um, but geographic data visualization and urban data visualization does not necessarily have to be on a map. Um, what we see is uh, another project of mine, which was actually my master's thesis. Um, and we see basically how many people are on the road if we look at it by going to that actual road and, and walking it up and down and counting people um, versus looking at this very same street uh, through an Instagram lens by checking various locations on that map um, uh, on, that, on that street through Instagram and count people there on these photos. Um, so I kind of like how these different perspectives on the same place diverge and are different. And also that if you look at in the real world, you see mostly men on the street. And if you look through Instagram, it's mostly women. So that it, it's, it's kind of funny to then ask, okay, where does this come from? And I think this is what we, what we want to do. Where does this come from? This is the question of today. So what we will talk about is first a brief introduction to data visualization. What is it? What is its purpose? How does it work? Um, to then talk about what do we mean with urban data? What do we talk about when we talk about urban data? Um, we will then have a brief look at some historic urban data visualizations um, and then look at, okay, how did it change throughout time? What are more contemporary examples of that visualization? Um, then we will have a short theory part um, basically, um, some ideas that Francesca and me have been developing um, to provide different pr perspectives to look at urban data. Um, and Francesca will give a brief introduction into sketching urban data, and then uh, also an introduction into the data walk that will happen later today, and to which this whole presentation is kind of like the interlude. Um, but let's uh, get to it. A very brief introduction to data visualization. Um, short disclaimer, if some of you ever did a lecture or had a presentation with Marianne Dirk, who is both of our supervisor, um, you may already know one slide or the other, because this is mostly inspired by his work. If you had not had the chance yet, uh, it's always a, a nice presentation. Um, so, a brief introduction to data visualization. Data visualization is the use of computer-supported interactive visual representations of data to amplify cognition. At least this is what Schneiderman and his colleagues said in the late 90s. And I think this rather broad definition still holds up today. Um, let's pick it apart. Interactive means that we have some sort of interface that allows us to search for structures or patterns in the data. We can filter data, we can zoom in or out, we can search for things, we can click on stuff to get details on demand, uh, and all of this uh, kind of interrogation of data through interactive interfaces. The result of that, uh, of that search is a visual representation, and it's visual because we rely on our visual senses and our visual apparatus, our eyes, our perception, 
in order to kind of make sense of this data, uh, in, in order to extract and decode what we see. Um, and the purpose of all of this is to amplify cognition. Um, we want to make discovery in terms of we want to see things in the data that we did not see before, like with that German, how do, how do the, the, the city names end uh, example. But I think what it's also about is about verifying hypotheses and communicating them. Often we have an idea of what is in the data and we can use visualization to falsify that idea or to verify it and then use the visualization again to communicate what we found out and what, what the visualization verified. Um, one of the key concepts in uh, data visualization are visual variables. Um, if we think of the data that is in the table on the one hand and something that we can visually perceive on the other hand, the question is, how do we get from A to B? How do we translate that? And this is where visual variables are kind of our dictionary. Um, what we can do is we can encode nominal, for example, um, religious groups uh, data, ordinal data, for example, age brackets um, that, are, that have some kind of order, but also numerical data, counting stuff, um, having an income uh, of an area, whatever, like kind of more continuous numerical data. And the most important visual variables that encode this are location and size. Location, where is something on a graph, and size, uh, how big is it? And I would argue, um, while size might not, like it's really important, but it might not be on every visualization, there is no visualization that works without location. So this is also one of the most important and most easily perceived visual variables. Um, and then another important example are colors. Uh, for example, uh, different color types, color tones to encode different ordinal uh, or nominal groups, but also color value that encodes numerical and continuous data. And this was all already uh, introduced by Jacques Bertin in the late 60s. Um, so this is not a very new concept, but obviously it has been further developed and further researched. And um, a lot has happened since uh, these early visual variables actually were presented. And we now have a much bigger palette of things to choose from in the bigger toolbox, even though I would say the original um, three to four visual variables are really the core and most important ones. So this was our very, very brief introduction to data visualization. Um, let's talk about what we talk about when we talk about urban data. Um, Often, I think urban data is kind of associated with this idea of smart city. And this is basically just a brief overview of a search result of Google image search on smart cities. So we have this idea of connected interfaces and uh, sensors that communicate the status of the city and internet of things. And for some weird reason, everything's blue. Um, so this is, I think, how urban data is often perceived in this technological sense. But I would argue that urban data actually often is um, much broader and not as technological. Um, if you wanted me to, to give a very, very broad definition of urban data, I would say three things. Uh, data are records of observations. Whenever you see something and you note it down in what shape or form ever, um, you created data. Um, Cities are urban, I think that's kind of obvious. And this means that urban data are any records of observations that happened in the city. So now that we have this super broad definition, you may ask, um, okay, what do we do with this? What, what are urban data for? And uh, to answer these questions, I, I want to introduce this idea of uh, transforming complex systems. Um, this is by the Wuppertal Institute, and it basically gives us three things that we need in order to change a complex system, such like a city. We need systemic knowledge on the one hand, we need to know what's going on currently. We need um, objective knowledge, we need to know what is our vision, where do we want to go. And we need transformation knowledge, we need the methods to go from A to B. Um, and I think where urban data actually comes to play is that it gives us very good knowledge about the current state of a system. And this is really its purpose. The better we know 
the, the current state, the better we know the problem, the better we can modify our possible solution and the methods that we apply to get there. Um, let's have a look at some examples, especially some early examples, because like I said, this idea of urban data has, in my eyes, nothing to do with this technological sense, but it's actually pretty old. Um, actually, uh, Giambattista Nolli in the 1700s uh, created this map of Rome, and basically what he did is he, he took a map and everything that he could not publicly access was black. So on the first view, you would see, okay, this is a map of streets and parks, like any map you, 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 you ever see. Um, but if you look closer, you see that all these um, like insides of buildings, uh, like churches or assembly halls are also uh, white. So what, we're, what we have is basically a measurement of how public, uh, publicly accessible a city is. And I think this is pretty impressive for the 1700s um, because it was kind of like the first data visualization that made this qualitative, that, that, that put something qualitative onto the map. Um, but we have other famous historic examples. Um, some of you may already know this. Uh, it's a really often cited example. The map of Jon Snow of, 18, of the 1850s, which depicts um, the cases of the cholera outbreak uh, that was going on in London during that time. And we see basically little bar charts on the side of the roads that basically count how many cholera cases were in what household along the road. Um, and if you look closer, you see that there is this little uh, pump uh, in the middle of the map right next to this really high bar chart. Um, and basically what this means is, uh, this was basically proving that um, the, the pump was one of the most important factors in transmitting cholera during that time. Um, and this visualization kind of made this visible. Now, it's sometimes said that this map was the way to find this out and nobody would have had the idea before. But like I said, um, often visualization is used to, to prove an assumption that you already have and to communicate it. And I think this was mostly the, the case for this map. It was not like the discovery of this idea. Um, another example, um, a, little, a little bit later in the 18th uh, century was Charles Booth. Uh, again, uh, we see a map of London and prior to that map, it was assumed that about one fourth of the population of London uh, was uh, considered uh, poor or living in poverty. Um, and that were, they were really just concentrating on a few uh, parts of London. And uh, Charles, Charles Booth disagreed with this notion. And what he did is he did a large survey, um, actually interviewing people um, throughout the city asking them about their income, like the size of their households, their age, and so on. And he, from this, created this map of social classes, where the red parts are poorer classes, and the, the blue charts, uh, the blue buildings and roads are more upper class um, people. And with this map, he proved not only that there were more people considered poor in the city of London during that time, but also that they were spread throughout the street, uh, th spread throughout the city, and therefore they could better address this problem of poverty after this map was created. Um, and we see that these older maps, they, they do two purposes of uh, data visualization. Um, they use our visual apparatus to convey information and they help us to to find out to make insights to make discovery to prove hypothesis but what they do not do is they do not allow us any kind of interface to inquiry uh, with the data so more recent examples like this visualization actually have more or less the ability to do so um, this is a map by eric fisher actually 10 years ago uh, tourists and locals um, based on data from the then really popular platform Flickr. And we see um, how people take pictures of the city uh, in this geocoded uh, image example. And then what Eric Fisher did is he assigned uh, statuses um, to these people who take the pictures based on their 
mobility profiles. Uh, is this person a tourist or is this person a local in the city that we are currently looking at, like Berlin in this case? And we see that the locals, which are encoded blue, are far more spread out throughout the city versus the tourists that really just consider a smaller part of the city uh, and take pictures of it. Um, so you might ask, okay, how is this different uh, to the previous examples? Um, I think just being able to, to have computational methods to make really large resolution images allows you to zoom in uh, on this map and to actually not only have the emerging patterns, but also view the single data point that is relevant um, in order to create this pattern. But then again, there are other more interactive examples. Um, this is actually by City Lab Berlin. Hello. Um, East in Keats, uh, a map of trees uh, and a map of how much it rained in certain areas of Berlin. And what I like about this map is on the one hand that you have uh, a bit more relevant uh, interaction, like you can view additional data points, um, but also it does something that only computational methods can do. It has one static part, the, the trees, more or less static, um, but it also has this feed, this constant feed of information where um, you see how much it rained in the last 30 days, um, which obviously you could not do with a static map. Um, so again, <laughs> this is something that would not have been possible 300 years ago. Um, and one last example I want to talk about is Sonic Cities by the MIT Sensible City Lab, basically showing um, the um, volume, the noise levels of various places throughout the United States um, and, and other countries um, before the corona crisis and during the corona crisis, basically just depicting that people um, moved away from the office buildings, moved into the parks, and that the volumes in the parks uh, rose. And what I like about this uh, visualization is, you can check it out for yourself, the visualization is linked, um, that you can take various perspectives on that data from, from various angles. And this is, again, something that only a computational interface would provide. Um, so enough of the shiny examples, let's go to the dry theory. How do we look at the city and how can we record what we see? And basically what I'm presenting is um, part of the result and the ideas of Francesca and me that we developed throughout the last one and a half, two years, and tries to, to answer this question um, with a, in, a, in a structured way. One super relevant dimension, I think, when we think about, th uh, uh, think about urban data collection is how close do we get to the street? And we, we call this, um, this axis the proximity axis. Um, we, on the one hand, we have distant methods. Um, we can look at the city, we can look at urban data from a, a bird's eye perspective. We can uh, see traffic data through Google Maps, we can uh, see bus plans, we can get any data and we can, this, we can do this from a distant place. We can sit at home and still look at another place in the city. It's pretty amazing on its own. Um, but obviously this is just one perspective because what we also have are any kind of situated methods. Um, like we could go to that very place that we just viewed from the bird's eye perspective and we could go there on our own and uh, see it, we can smell it, we can look around and see what's interesting to us ab about this place um, and we get a first-hand perspective uh, through our own eyes that has not been processed by anybody, by anybody else. But obviously we, we lose the ability to get any kind of overview. So. What I think is interesting is that we, to, to get a whole picture of any place, you kind of need to combine these two different um, approaches. And it's not only the, the proximity axis that is interesting to us. We also have the axis of texture, like what kind of data do we produce when we go there or when we look at the place from a distant view? On the one hand, we have qualitative data. like. I saw car after car crossing the intersection. They made a lot of noise and it did not smell nice. 
um, which is super qualitative. It's just this first-hand report of me telling you what I observed, creating some kind of urban data. Um, but we also have the more traditional ideas of urban data, just going out and counting stuff. Um, and obviously they, they are, again, observations of the same phenomenon, but through different perspectives. So actually, because I think this is kind of the part of the core of what we're trying to say, let's briefly go through this again. If we combine all of this, on the one hand, we have distant methods that span across qualitative data and quantitative data. We take the bird's eye view. We can, on the one hand, um, have quantitative data like Google uh, or any other kind of numerical data that gives us one perspective on the city. But we could also get qualitative data from this distant perspective. We could look at the city through Instagram. How are geotech pictures on Instagram or Flickr? Um, how do, um, for example, um, how do restaurant uh, reviews read on any of these platforms on Yelp uh, and stuff like that? Like all the things that we could do from our home, but across the spectrum of different data textures. Opposed to this is actually any kind of observation on the street. Qualitative data, like I said, um, getting reports, making pictures, drawing people, um, recording interviews, whatever. But also what we could do on the street are quantitative methods. We could uh, go out and count people. We could not record their voices, but record the noise levels uh, or the brightness. Um, and all of these uh, things that are actually countable, but the, that we can only count when we are there. Um, on the other hand, we have all the other stuff that is on the qualitative axis, descriptive output of what we actually do. Uh, again, distant methods, we can uh, look at Instagram, whatever, or we can uh, go there and do interviews. And it's kind of redundant now, I know. Um, or we can produce some kind of numerical data. So what I want to do, like what is the gist of all of this? Um, I think, Basically, if you remember this image that, that I put on earlier, there is this really popular and maybe beaten path of, okay, we kind of expect things to be that way, um, but it's also interesting to see it. And this is what we get, again, from the top right to the, from, from the bottom left to the top right corner, yes. Um, we, we, we see a lot of things happening there when we combine distant methods and quantitative data because this is what we expect. And when we combine qualitative and situated methods. But what I think um, is interesting is what happens um, off the beaten path. Um, what happens if we combine distant methods and qualitative data? What do we learn about the city when we combine this with other sources? Just as what happens when we combine quantitative and situated methods? And with this, <laughs> enough of this prior theory, we are back to Francesca. Uh, I guess that that was a lot of very interesting, but a lot of information. So um, um, probably now we are left a little bit wondering how could you actually put it to play uh, when it comes especially to our workshop. Uh, luckily, we don't have all, all the time have to be really expert coders or information designers to um, work with data. We have some powerful allies, which are pen, colors, and uh, paper that will help us out. And that's why today I also want, want to talk about data sketching, which is something that both me and Tobias do a lot, I would say. Um, as I said, uh, there's no necessity of using a computer or knowing how to code or necessarily use Illustrator or Sketch when we visualize data for our daily practice. Pen and paper are often enough and you, information designers are very often using data sketching as a method to put um, their first ideas on paper, but also to properly map out um, information. Uh, there are a lot of different approaches and sketching can be used for many, many different purposes. But for the sake of our presentation, I will just guide you through two main ways of using data sketching. 
The first one is sketching for prototyping, and it's very similar to what you would do for in the U UI or UX uh, practice. So basically, um, it's it's a first um, dump of idea on, on, on paper using pens, using colors, using just what you have at your own disposal. Uh, as Volney and, 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 and others pointed out um, in their paper on uh, data sketching, it's actually a very effective way of promoting innovation, creativity, and in general, and thinking in general. And I would also add that it's also very useful when you are collaborating with others and you want to explore the data that you have at hand or um, try new models. The example that you see here on this slide are all, all coming from the lab. So it's uh, our colleagues uh, really nicely end over their own sketches today and they are cute, I would say. Uh, the second way of using data sketching is what is actually interesting for us uh, and it will be very much used later during our workshop. And it's sketching for mapping. So we can actually use sketching to collect and represent urban data on the spot. We could even use sketch, sketches as a proper way of designing visualizations. Uh, if we are dealing with data sets that are uh, uh, the representation of our personal data of emotions or what just we are witnessing on the street, sketching sometimes is the most powerful way of actually representing urban uh, information. And keep in mind that our final goal is to actually create knowledge and share information and, and communicate what we found on the street. So sometimes just drawing on, on paper is um, enough. And that, that brings us to actually uh, the practical detail of our workshop today, which I'm really excited uh, about it. Um, we are going to collect urban data on the ground. So we will go, we will go and choose our area of interest. We will define a small research question and we will collect meaningful information while exploring. Why are we doing that? Well, if you don't know, it's because you didn't pay attention. So get out. No, but because as researchers, but also as activists, as citizens and urban scholars, it's very important to look at the city with an attentive eyes and also positioning ourselves in the design space that we just learned about through Tobias slides. It's actually a, a really powerful tool to know your city better and mixing situated and distant methods. It, it, it's also fundamental to actually share, generate and share knowledge on the urban landscape. Where are we going to do it? at Temple of Herfeld. It's going to happen after the lunch break at 14. We will have some time for the uh, live Q&A. Um, and then we will just get off and start mapping. Uh, th this exercise will mix digital and physical flannerism. So you will need a small, small notebooks, pen, colors, glue, scissors, and other tools to incorporate all the artifacts, but you will also need a laptop with an internet connection and a phone to take photos. Uh, we will split uh, in groups, so you will have to form groups uh, with a minimum of three people and a maximum of seven, and each person will have one or more roles. Uh, probably later we will show you again this slide, so don't panic, you don't have to know all the roles now, but as you can see, we have three main uh, groups, which are the navigator, which is the person that chooses the path and eventually also documents uh, where, where are you moving, the qualitative or situated researcher and the quantitative and distant researcher. Obviously, the groups, the seven people groups can take just one role, while reduced group will have to take one or more roles, depending on uh, how many of you there are. Uh, as an output, we will produce a digital journal of your experience. So we will set up a mirror board and collect and connect all the drawing artifacts and photos that you have collected during your journey. And with this, I thank you. I thank you for being here. <laughs>